That's what an FMS Super Cub usually looks like. And this is what our FMS Super Cub looks like. What's up everybody? You're watching Model Aviator. My name's Adam. And as you can tell, our FMS Super Cub is a little different. In today's video, we're going to take you through everything we did to this to make it look the way that it looks. We'll show you some great flying footage. But first, we thought we'd tell you what inspired us to do this in the first place. We're subscribed to a lot of YouTube channels, aviation channels, both full-scale as well as RC. And a lot of the full-scale aviation channels are backcountry and bush pilots. Quite a few of those guys early in the year started posting that a man named Greg Miller, who has a YouTube channel called Mall Guy, was posting some new material, the first in several years. He'd been quite inactive on YouTube, and they seemed to be really inspired and really excited by the fact that this gentleman was posting new stuff. So they wanted their viewers to check it out, and we did. Well, after watching some of Greg's videos and then doing a little research, I came to find out that Greg Miller started a series of DVDs back in 2005 called Big Rocks and Long Props. This was the first really good footage of backcountry pilots that anybody had ever gotten to see a great deal of. We're, we got it made now. There's so much of that on YouTube. Uh, you can watch it all day. But in 2005, that was the only game in town. So I got his first DVD off his website and ended up liking it so much that I bought the rest of them. I think there's like seven altogether. They're great. His YouTube channel is great. And something I saw on Greg's YouTube channel is what inspired this airplane. So we're going to show you some footage from Greg's channel, Mall Guy, right now. See if you can figure out what inspired this. Check this out. I never get tired of watching that footage. The fact that that man can take off and land on rocks that I could get a Jeep stuck in it never ceases to amaze me. And as far as what inspired this, I'm sure that was pretty easy to figure out. Greg has a full-scale Super Cub that he built from a Javron kit, and it looks like this. That was the inspiration for this. And that said, I have to really give a big shout out to Greg Miller. I corresponded with him via email, asked his permission, to build a model of his airplane. He helped a great deal along the way, answered a ton of questions, sent me some pictures, and made trying to get this as close as I can, considering it's a foamy, uh, much, much easier than it would have been without his help. Uh, so Greg, thank you so much. Thank you for allowing us to use some of your footage in our video. And we just hope that we do you and your plane justice. Um, so with that, we're going to show you guys exactly what we did to this thing to make it look like Greg's airplane. So a big part of this project was obviously going to be the paintwork. And I'm not an expert at painting foam airplanes, so I sought some help from the RC Geek on YouTube, Chris Wolf. I emailed him about other things before, and we'd uh, had some friendly back and forth. So Chris was nice enough to make some suggestions. And based on his suggestions, what we did was once we got the decals off, we used lightweight spackle to cover up some of the little pits that are caused into foam once you pull decals off. Then we clear coated the foam with three coats of Minwax clear gloss polyurethane and wet sanded that in between each coat to better prepare the foam for paint and harden it up a bit. Then we used the Rust-Oleum two times paint primer combination paint series to do all the paint work and then finally top that off with one more coat of the clear to make it nice and shiny like Greg's airplane and then we got to work on the details and we'll show you those now. And up top you can see some of Heidi's handiwork. She hand painted the fuel caps and I just used a push pin and bent it to make the little vent tube 
and here you can see the upper window Heidi hand painted that and I glued the little radio antenna here because that's where it is on Greg's airplane not out on the wing where FMS wants you to put it so Greg doesn't have a spinner on his Jabron Cub the FMS Super Cub comes with a large spinner back plate that covers a really large hole in the front of the cowling the holes much larger than scale uh, you never see it because of the spinner back plate normally so I had to make the hole in the front of the cowling scale size and to do that we used some strip styrene, some millimeter thick, and cut a piece to fit and siliconed it into the cowling, used a little body filler, some sanding and some paint, and made the hole the correct size. We're also actually using the spinner back plate because there is a hex that is on the prop adapter on the FMS Super Cub, and we need a hex on whatever kind of propeller backplate that we use to go over that. So we just used the one that came with it and cut the spinner backplate down and that worked out. So underneath the plane to make our scale exhaust stacks we used KNS aluminum tubing. Of course we've got the Dubro five and a half inch big wheels. We shimmed the struts with a piece of quarter inch ply and the reason we did that is this airplane has fun cubbish dihedral when it's stock and a full scale super cub doesn't have near that much dihedral they have actually little to none depending on how you build them um, so we're able to do that because the carbon fiber wing tube the channels that the wing tube fits in in the wings are actually loose enough you can move the wings as much as an inch and a half so we're actually able to shim the struts and bring the dihedral down. These pieces of balsa are there for two reasons just to kind of clean this area up and hide a bit when you're looking at the airplane from the side that we've actually shimmed the struts and also it gave us a place to mount our little step. Those steps are actually welded pieces of metal directly on the gear on Greg's airplane. We cheated and just used carbon fiber tube and glued it to our balsa close to the gear since this articulates. Uh, we figured trying to glue anything to the gear would just come off. So we used a simple little method for doing our flying wires. We used elastic cord. When you use this method, you can use pull pole wire if you'd rather use that. What we did was we drilled holes in both horizontals and the vertical. And if you look closely, you'll notice that on either side of the holes we drilled, we used a tiny little metal washer. Those washers are there to keep your wire or your elastic cord from digging into the foam. And in this case, it's one continuous piece of elastic cord. It starts tied to a self-tapping screw underneath the airplane, goes all the way through and ends back at that same self-tapping screw. We just tied it in both places and screwed the screw into the bottom of the airplane. And that's how we did the flying wires. All right, so now we're going to get to the fun part, the flying. But before we do, I just wanted to point a couple things out. At the end of the video, we're going to post our setup like we do a lot of times. It's important that you understand this is a very mission-specific setup. We built this airplane to do exactly what you're going to see it do in the video, which is pretty much scale and stole, scale stole flying. Uh, now, when you say stole flying, where a lot of RC pilots' minds go is the maximum performance capability of the model, not necessarily the maximum performance capability of the full-scale counterpart of the model, but the model. Well, all the models are grotesquely overpowered. They have wing loadings that are a fraction of the wing loading uh, and a mass quotient that is a fraction of what the airplane weighs. And even though you can't scale down the atmosphere, all that stuff still makes a difference. What it means is that the model can outperform the full-scale airplane by a lot. That's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is mimic Greg's full-scale Javron Cub. It's a 160 horsepower airplane that with Greg and fuel weighs anywhere from 1,400 to 1,500 pounds when he's flying around in it. So consequently, his landings in the backcountry are anywhere from 100 to 150 feet, which is still very short, but it's not you know, world record stole contest short. And so that's not what we're shooting for. This airplane is about one six and a quarter scale, best we, we can tell from our math. 
So that means that to mimic Greg's landing distances, we need to land within 16 to 24 feet. So that's what we built the airplane to do. We actually added mass. We took power out with a throttle curve uh, so that our climb rate would be scale. Uh, and that's what you're going to see. So hopefully you'll enjoy this and you'll tune in next week when we'll show something that's a lot more aerobatic. Uh, please don't forget to check out Greg's channel, Mall Guy. Uh, and please like, comment, and subscribe. We're glad you're here, and we hope to see you next week. Enjoy. So here we're going to start with a conventional takeoff, a touch and go, and a conventional landing. One interesting thing to point out here, the ground was really saturated and wet on this day at this venue, and you'll notice on this touch and go, as well as in other places, the water really grabbed those big wheels and was pulling me around. I was having to fight it with rudder a pretty good bit. Here we're going to do a little bit more of a stall takeoff. Not trying too terribly hard, but that was a good bit shorter than a conventional takeoff. Cubs and slips just go together. On this landing, we're going to mimic what Greg Miller does when he's going into a backcountry strip that he hasn't been into, and we're going to wheel land it. It's going to be a stole landing, not as slow as we can get it, but pretty slow. A lot shorter than the conventional landing. Here we're setting up to do something I've seen cubs do my whole life, and that's a one-wheeler. With that saturated ground, it's a little bit more complicated, but not too bad. On this slip to landing, we put it into a full three point, and that's a pretty short landing. This slip flyby I put in just because it looked cool. Now we're going to land across the runway. This is pretty much a full on stole landing. I'm going to contact the ground here about as slow as I can get the airplane to go. 
coming in across the runway over the hill just to add a little bit of challenge and the slow motion really shows you what that articulating gear does. And that's exactly what we want. Main wheels first and short. And so now we've changed venues and this is an uphill stall takeoff. Again, not pushing it too terribly hard, not climbing out too steep. Don't really have an obstacle close we had to climb over, so there was no need to press anything. These early morning flights are really something else. The sky is beautiful, the wind is really, really calm, which doesn't exactly shorten your takeoffs and landings by any measure, but it sure is fun to fly in. And the uphill landings are a little bit more tricky, especially to make them smooth. That's about as close to a three-point without being a three-point as you can get, which is what we're shooting for. So on this one, we're going to turn around, do a little slip, and come in downhill, which adds another kind of a different level of difficulty. It's easier to grease it, but you roll out a little farther. Now right there, believe it or not, I actually let the P factor pull the airplane to the left because I knew I was going to go out over the pond. This is just for the RC pilots that want to see with this setup at this weight what the slow flight looks like with this airplane. This is full flaps. You can get it just a little slower than this, but not much. This is not bad. Obviously it's not as slow as you could go at the stock weight. We're a little heavier, but it's pretty slow, and as you can see, even with our rearward balance, it's easily controllable. And another Greg Miller backcountry wheel landing. So here's where it gets really interesting and backcountry-ish, if you will. Rocks are taken off and landing on here, or nowhere near as big as the ones that Greg takes off and lands on, but it is a gravel road and considering the size of our model, not a bad challenge. This is a one-way landing because the clubhouse and parking lot is behind us, so once you commit to landing, you're coming in or else. People that watch a lot of backcountry aviation on YouTube will know what a one-way is. For those folks that don't, a one-way is any landing where once committed, there is no go-around. You are fully committed and forced to live with your decision and go ahead and land or have an accident. It's one of the challenging things that backcountry pilots live for. Here we're paying tribute to some of Greg Miller's videos. Watch that left wheel go hammering through that water as we take off. And of course, for those that are wondering, we had permission from the club president to be landing on this road. And even though there is a clubhouse and parking lot behind us, there are no cars or people in them where there just Heidi and myself and a person spotting for us to let us know if there are cars coming up the driveway.
This next landing will be our last in Greg Miller fashion. We're going to do it in slow motion because it just looks so cool. Be sure and check out how the big tires throw gravel around. Please smash that like button, subscribe, be sure and check out Greg's channel, Mall Guy. The setup page is coming up right after this, and we really appreciate you folks spending time with us and watching, and we sure hope we see you next week. Until then, happy flying. <laughs> back by Piper in the band. Woo! I've been watching these backcountry bush pilots on YouTube, and I done come up with me some observations. You feel the airplane ain't got big tires on it? You're a sissy. Bubba. What? That's me. Well, what if it's true? It doesn't matter. It's me. It is true. Greg Miller catches fish, and Trent Palmer catches bait. Bubba! What? You can't pick on Trent Palmer. I ain't picking on Trent Palmer. All I'm saying is Greg Miller fishes in a river, and Trent Palmer fishes in a creek about as wide as my bathtub. You ever notice when bush pilots name their planes that sounds like a band that ought to be opening up for Leonard Skinner? The bush pilots are the only guys you'll find that argue over who's got the shortest one. Bubba! I'm talking about runways. What do you think I meant?